Hello. Welcome to Archival Adventures on twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios and twitch.tv slash Rogan27. Um, this is a weekly live program that I stream here from the archives and special collections at Virginia Tech. Um, before we get started, I just have a couple of acknowledgments to make. Um, <clears throat> Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with their land and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to prosim that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. So that is the official Virginia Tech land acknowledgement and labor acknowledgement. Um, I believe that we need to actually do more to support um, historically marginalized communities, which is why I choose to include them at the beginning of every stream so that I can help to remind myself, um, you know, that fundament fundamental truth that uh, we need to actually pay attention to. So, hi Fluidan, hi Key Squared, um, <coughs> welcome to this stream. Um, this is the second Wednesday in October. And the Wednesdays in October, I reserved for spooky and creepy items from either our archival collections or our rare books collection. So we will be continuing that theme today. Uh, today's stream title is It Came From the Archives, um, because that sounds kind of spooky. But in addition to that, today is also Ask an Archivist Day. So on one day every year in October, archivists on Twitter open themselves up and just say, hey, ask us questions. So, and that is done with the, either the Ask an Archivist hashtag or the Ask an Archivist Day hashtag. And uh, the questions are sometimes super silly and sometimes kind of very technical and kind of just open for anything. So it's kind of like an <clears throat> archival profession ask me anything day. Um, and so since I'm streaming today, I thought, heck, you know, ask me. <laughs> so in the tweets for today's episode, I did include uh, the hashtags uh, Ask an Archivist Day and Ask an Archivist. So, you know, we may get some additional people in with questions, and that is totally fine. I am always completely open to people asking archival related questions on this program. That is part of why this program exists. Um, Hannah, thank you so much for the resubscription and welcome. Uh, I hope that you are having a good day. Um, yeah, so sorry, I'm distracting myself and trying to stay on task for actually doing a program for work. Um, for anybody new, uh, this is a program I do once a week. Um, I am Anthony Wright Day Hernandez, the uh, Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. Um, on the internet and on Twitch specifically, I go by the name Rogan27, um, and that is uh, my channel. And then the university has a Twitch channel, and this program goes out to both of them because, you know, if I can reach a wider audience, why not? Uh, so uh, we, we have fun. We do silly things on this channel. I have brought in pulp sci-fi novel or pulp sci-fi magazines and just shared them on the channel that was i think the very first episode which was lucky enough to be on january 6th 2021 and nothing important happened that day during my stream at all um <clears throat> except you know people storming the u.s capitol 
So it was an auspicious start to the program, uh, but we have we've made it through. We got going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Hi, hi, Orangitis. Yeah, Hannah, I do have the green screen today. Um, I am back in the space that I streamed in for most of the year um, because the space that they moved me to because this space needed to be available for reservation for like students and professors and other people who want to use it uh, once the semester started. That space is being painted. So this week I'm here and who knows where I'll be next week. Um, most likely won't have a green screen f for a while unless I'm in this space for some reason, but you know, it's fine. I like having the backdrop with the Torgerson Bridge behind me. Um, that bridge is actually connected to the library. Um, it's nice to have that. Plus, then when I go to the document screen, you get the green screen around me and you can see more of the document without having the borders of the, the headshot window. Um, so ultimately, I prefer that, but <laughs> yeah, it's scheduling. It's, it's all about the space. This is our recording studio. Um, so we have a camera in here that's set up for one touch recording where somebody can come in and hit the start recording button and just stand in front of the camera and record something. And so it's used so that professors can record lectures or do things like that, or students can come in and record video projects. We also have a sound booth in here where somebody can come in and do like a, record a podcast if they wanted to. Um, we have audio editing software. We've got a uh, like comp com composition station with a keyboard and things like that. So it's a multi-use space and um, it, this year is much more active and busy on campus, so much harder to just say, nope, it's not available at all on Wednesday afternoons. So yeah, anyway, um, th that's, that's what's going on there. I do have things set up so that I could stream from my office if I had to. I've got a backdrop in there. It's not a green screen, but a backdrop. I've got a camera. I've got uh, all of like the streaming hardware, the stuff that we absolutely have to have to make the stream work is on a cart that I could take down to my office if I have to. But the lighting is better here and the acoustics are better here and there's not the constant drum of an air handling system. Whereas in, in my office, I could do it, but the lighting wouldn't be as good and there would be a, like there's a constant background uh, noise of the air handling system that is always on. So it's not the ideal space, but I could do it from there if I had to. Anyway, how about we, uh, we start looking at some of the creepy things that I brought today. Um, if you recall last week when we started uh, Spoopy Month, um, I started with vertical files on um, Ghosts and Folklore from Montgomery County, Virginia and Southwest Virginia, respectively. And there were, you know, some interesting things in there. <clears throat> not especially creepy, but one thing it did not include is true crime. So this week I came prepared with true crime. Uh, let me switch to the document focus. All right, I don't have like single buttons to, to switch scenes here, but here I have a vertical file. This is a biographical vertical file on Henry Lee Lucas. So you may or may not be familiar with Henry Lee Lucas. Oh, was not worth it. Oh yes, yes, there was. Oh my, the black cat man. Um, I was not worth it. Uh, yeah, the animal. I, I stopped reading the black cat man stuff. That was a bit more graphic than I had anticipated getting into. Um, I, I will look at these, but you know, content warning, trigger warning. Uh, the first thing that we're looking at today is a vertical file on a serial killer. So just to let you know, there may be some sensitive topics discussed, such as murder. And it's mostly newspaper articles. I don't know how much detail they will go in. 
Uh, if I start to encounter something that is exceedingly graphic, I will stop reading. Uh, but I haven't looked at them, so I don't know. Um, <clears throat> Henry Lee Lucas uh, was born August 23rd, 1936, and died March 12th, 2001. Um, he died in prison because he was sentenced to life in prison. Yeah, you never know what you're going to get from the archives. <laughs> um, so I, there's a Wikipedia article about him. I'm not going to read it yet because I want to look at the documents first. But um, he was an American ser serial killer who was born in Blacksburg, Virginia, uh, which is where Virginia Tech is located. So this is a local, um, <laughs> a local serial killer. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure that any place really wants that claim to fame, especially a place as small as Blacksburg, but we have it. <clears throat> I am uncertain, but I think uh, if anyone is familiar with Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, um, there is an album of theirs called Murder Ballads, and I do believe that the song Henry Lee might possibly be about this person. I haven't um, investigated that too in depth, so if somebody wanted to check and confirm for me, if uh, the song Henry Lee on Murder Ballads by Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds is about Henry Lee Lucas, I would appreciate that. Um, I just, I like that album. It's a fun one to listen to this time of year especially. And I was like, oh, I wonder if that song is about him, but then I just haven't had time to check. All right, so newspaper articles. Uh, I'm going to zoom in a bit so that, because this is a small article. But th this is where we'll start. I do still have the Edgar, Edgar Allan Poe books, so if you have a specific Poe item that you would like to hear me read today, uh, do let me know, and I'll be happy to read some Edgar Allan Poe. Um, I also have uh, some items from our collection with illustrations by Edward Gorey. Uh, so we can definitely look at those. All right, let's autofocus on this. Blacksburg woman discovered slain. Roanoke Times, January 14th, 1960. Police said here tonight that a 24-year-old Blacksburg man wanted for questioning in the stabbing death of his mother hasn't shown up in, the air, in this area. Michigan State Police said the body of the mother, Mrs. Viola Lucas, 74, also of Blacksburg, was found today in the bedroom of the Tecumseh, Michigan home of her daughter, Mrs. Carol Jennings. The son, Henry Lee Lucas, has been missing since Monday night, Michigan officers said. Blacksburg police said they understand Lucas may be headed back to Blacksburg by bus or auto. But they said a check of the, of the section where the Lucases lived revealed no clues. A pathologist said Mrs. Lucas died of a stab wound in the neck. Lucas and his mother were said to have visited a tavern Monday night. Mrs. Lucas and her son had been visiting Mrs. Jennings. Blacksburg police said Lucas came to Blacksburg before Christmas and took his mother on the visit to Michigan. Mrs. Jennings discovered her mother's body. Coroner Edward Braun said Mrs. Lucas had been dead for 12 hours. <clears throat> the next item in here, and these are not like in chronological order or anything, they're just in this folder. Um, the next item in here, uh, Roanoke Times, I don't know what and WN means. RT is Roanoke Times. I, I am assuming it had a longer title at some point in the past, but I'm not familiar. But uh, this is from the Roanoke Times, June 25th, 1983, page one. Drifter says he killed 100 women, from Staff and Wire reports. Montague, Texas. Henry Lee Lucas, a drifter and former mental patient who grew up in Blacksburg, Virginia, claims he has killed 100 women. And law enforcement officials are questioning him as a suspect in some of the I-35 murders of young women. 
About 20 women who were hitchhiking or had car trouble along Interstate 35 were the victims in a string of slayings that stretched from Austin to northern Oklahoma in the late 1970s and 1980s. Lucas, who was charged this week in Texas with three murders, laughed Thursday when a judge set his bail at $1 million and pledged to help officials solve the slayings of the 100 women he says he has killed. Lucas was convicted and imprisoned more than two decades ago for murdering his mother, Viola Lucas, in Black of Blacksburg, while the two were visiting Mrs. Lucas's daughter in Tecumseh, Michigan. Lucas stabbed his mother to death with a paring knife on January 12, 1960, after they had argued about her wish to return to Blacksburg, according to news, uh, according to news reports at the time in the Detroit Free Press. Oh, interesting! Uh, Key Squared, thank you for looking it up. Uh, Wikipedia says the Nick Cave song is based on a child ballad, uh, and the name is a coincidence. Uh, you don't know how authoritative that is, though the footnotes are thin. But thank you for looking. I, I did not know. I was just like, hmm, the name, it, it could be, but, uh, you know, I did not know for sure. So, song is definitely not about him. It's a version of a young hunting song can be traced back to the 18th century. Thank you, Fluid N, for confirming. I, I didn't know. I just thought it, it struck me that the name was similar, and so I thought I would bring it up. Plus, I love that song. I love that whole album. It is a creepy and frightening album, but it's so fun to listen to. Uh, <laughs> um, Lucas stabbed his mother to death uh, after, okay, where was I? Ah. I hated my mother because she always lied, especially about my father, Lucas told police. According to the news reports, Travis County Sheriff's Depart Detective uh, Gary Cutler and Montague County Sheriff W.F. Conway confirmed Thursday that they think Lucas is responsible for at least some of the deaths. Williamson County Sheriff Jim Boutwell said Lucas has been linked but not charged with one of the deaths, the 1980 slaying of a woman hitchhiker at Georgetown, about 30 miles north of Austin. He's been charged with three slayings, has talked about as many as 60 murders, and claims he killed about 100 women in Texas and 15 other states. Texas Ranger Char uh, Carl Weathers of Lubbock said he is skeptical of Lucas's claims. Lucas has been definitely linked to only four killings, Weathers said. I don't believe he's intentionally lying. There are things he's specific about and things he's very vague about. Who knows for sure how many slayings are involved, Weathers said. Montague County District Attorney Jack McGaughy said Friday it will take several days or a couple of weeks before anything further develops in the case. Yeah, Lord Portico, <laughs> welcome. Yeah, only four killings. Um, regardless, uh, let's see. Lucas also said he has killed women in New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, California, Oregon, South Dakota, Minnesota, Illinois, Michigan, New Jersey, West Virginia, Florida, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and Missouri, according to authorities. And the next part of this, I, so I skipped ahead a little bit. So this is an article about him being jailed in Texas. Um charged with three murders. Lucas was released in 1975 from a Michigan prison where he was serving time for murdering his mother. After his release from prison in 1975, Lucas spent most of the next eight years traveling and sleeping in his car, making the missions, uh, making the missions, getting a roofing job here or there, said, Texas, said a Texas ranger. Henry don't sleep much, said Phil Ryan, a ranger who had been talking to Lucas about Mrs. Rich's death since October. All he did was drive. All he needed was cigarettes and gas and an old clunker car. A month at a time was all he stayed in most places. Ryan said Lucas told him he met Ms. Pow Ms. Powell in 1981 when he was staying at her grandmother's boarding house in Jacksonville. After her grandmother died and her mother committed suicide, Ryan said the 13-year-old was placed in a youth detention center but fled with Lucas. Lucas's family was living about eight miles outside Blacksburg when, when he grew up there in the 1940s and 1950s. A Blacksburg school census from 1945 listed Lucas as being in the first grade, even though he was nine years old at the time. 
His father, Anderson Lucas, was listed in the census as being unemployed and crippled. And again, I will just bring up, because I did not mention it this stream, these are historic documents. They sometimes contain language that we would not consider appropriate today. In 1952, when Lucas was 16, his mother was found guilty in Montgomery County General District Court of not making him attend school. Montgomery County court files show no criminal record for Lucas. However, news reports from Jackson, Michigan, uh, Citizen Patriot in 1960 said he was released from the Virginia State Penitentiary in September 1959 after serving a prison term for breaking and entering. Officials at the Virginia Department of Corrections refused Friday to release any, re uh, any information citing the Privacy Act. In 1959, Lucas joined his mother in Tecumseh, Michigan, where they... Yeah, and then it goes into him killing his mother again. <clears throat> so... I mean, this would have been big news around here when it happened, because... Hello, serial killer! From here! <laughs> Um, November 30th, 1985, h half of Lucas murder cases now solved. As from the Associated Press, location, Dallas. Case after case against alleged serial killer Henry Lee Lucas has been unraveled and many investigations are being reopened, say authorities in states where the convicted killer has been, had been implicated. Authorities say nearly half of the murder cases the Texas Rangers attributed to con convicted killers, Lucas or Otis Toole, are under investigation again or were never closed. Lucas considered the, deadly, considered the deadliest serial killer in U.S. history after he ban, began confessing to hundreds of murders after he was arrested in Texas in 1983, <clears throat> is now widely viewed as the perpetrator of a gigantic hoax. He took a lot of people for a ride, said Texas Attorney General Jim Maddox. A Dallas Times-Herald survey of lawmen in charge of investigating 191 murder cases closed by the Rangers led... Uh, Lucas Homicide Task Force shows that 90 are now considered unsolved. 43 of those crimes had been attributed to Lucas, 14 to Toole, and 33 to both men acting together. The Times-Herald, which reported on the investigation Friday, earlier ch challenged the validity of their confessions in an investigative series that revealed evidence placing them far from the scenes of many of their alleged crimes. Maddox, who has uh, completed an investigation into, Lucas, into the Lucas affair, said last week he believed sloppy police work made it possible for Lucas to pull off the hoax. If I were the police officers around the country, around this country, I would reopen virtually every case that was cleared by Henry Lucas's confessions. Maddox said, I would rather have an uncleared case than to have one closed based on a Lucas confession. Many officers are standing by their decisions to accept the confessions. Colonel Jim Adams, Texas Department of Public Safety Chief and Commander of the Texas Rangers, said he remains convinced that Lucas killed a substantial number of people. But nearly as many lawmen now acknowledge there were problems with Lucas cases. In San Antonio, the Bexar County Sheriff's Department recently reopened six murder cases it had attributed to Lucas last April. Houston police have reopened nine murder cases. Grand juries in the central Texas counties of McLennan and San Saba uh, declined to indict Lucas in four slayings to which he had confessed, and the Lubbock County District Attorney asked a district court judge to throw out three indictments against Lucas because of additional evidence that came to light in the Times-Herald investigation. In St. Tammany Parish, Louisiana, a grand jury refused to indict Lewis and began an investigation into the conduct of the officers who obtained four Lucas confessions and claimed to have evidence linking him to the crimes. The evidence turned out to be either fabricated or non-existent, the newspaper said. The report on Maddox's investigation has not been made public, but it may be the epilogue in the controversy surrounding Lucas and Toole. Maddox's office has conducted the only official in-depth probe into Lucas's whereabouts during the eight years he was supposed to have been crisscrossing the country on a crime spree of unmatched fury. The Florida Department of Law Enforcement conducted a similar but more limited investigation of Toole, and the two agencies reached similar conclusions. It's as obvious to me as it is to professional law enforcement individuals that Henry was taking a lot of people on a ride and that it appeared some of them wanted to be taken on a ride, Maddox said. 
<clears throat> At the very least, there was a massive amount of sloppy police work done. He added, that's assuming that there was no intention to deceive anybody. That's the very best light in which it can be looked at. Lucas was convicted of killing his mother in 1960. Since 1983, has, he has been convicted of murder in five cases and pleaded guilty in five more, including the slaying of a West Virginia Highway Patrolman killed in 1976. One of his convictions in the 1979 slaying of an unidentified hitchhiker near Georgetown, Texas, was on a capital murder charge and he was sentenced to death by injection. Toole was convicted of murder in a boarding house fire in Jacksonville, Florida. <clears throat> Oh, Key Squared, I hope that your committee meeting goes well, and I look forward to seeing you later. <clears throat> Let's see. If, so I think we've got the gist of the story. Um, killed his mom, went to prison in Michigan, was let out of prison, apparently killed additional people, claimed he killed a hundred or more people, <clears throat> but... Uh, seems to have not been responsible for all of those. <laughs> it takes three to be considered a serial killer, and for most serials, four would be, would, uh, be an only statement. <clears throat> Interesting, Hannah. I did not know that. <clears throat> well, it sounds like he's got at least six that he was convicted of because that article mentioned five convictions in Texas plus the conviction of killing his mom and said he was charged with at least five more <clears throat> authorities backtracking on serial killing claims Interesting. <laughs> of course there's a definition on what a serial killer is. <clears throat> Blacksburg remembers. Uh, let's see, what is this from? Oh, I don't know what this... Somebody has handwritten here in the margin a I-M-N-M? -M? But I have no idea what newspaper that stands for. So it's definitely, <clears throat> huh, I'm not certain. There was a paper called the Montgomery News Messenger based out of Christiansburg, Virginia, which is right next to Blacksburg. Um, but it was in operation from 31 to 67, it looks like. And this is an article from 84. So not certain what paper this is from, but it is definitely a local paper to the Blacksburg-Christiansburg area. Lucas had early criminal tendency. This one's a bit bigger. I'm going to zoom out a bit. <clears throat> by Lucy Proctor, staff writer. Henry Lee Lucas, believed to have committed more murders than any single person in the history of the United States, was born in Blacksburg, August 23, 1936. And I will note, just based on the dates, uh, this article is from two years before they started realizing that he had claimed a responsibility in many more murders than he had actually committed. 
he enjoyed the attention. Yes, was not worth it. I, I think you are absolutely correct. Most residents would just as soon forget that. Others tr try to recall something of importance about the soft-spoken killer with a glass eye. In their remembrances may lie a clue to what drove a small, skinny boy in tattered clothes to become one of the nation's most notorious mass murderers. His schoolmates at the three-room Mount Tabor School in the early 1940s recall three things about Lucas. He was uninterested in school, he was kept back in the first grade for at least three years, and his family was poor. Poor may not adequately describe the dirt floor shack on Craig Creek Lucas shared with his family. They were said to be the poorest of the poor in Montgomery County in those days. Lucas was named after his father, a double amputee. Some uh, sarcastically say the senior Lucas deliberately sat on the railroad tracks and allowed a passing train to take his legs in order to obtain disability money. I'm not even sure that was worth repeating in the newspaper. It's definitely hearsay. It's definitely derogatory towards them. And definitely not good to say things like that about uh, people who are disabled. Um, that, that, this was 1984. So hopefully we've come a little ways since then. Really? You put that in the paper. If it were true, that's a terrible way to get money. Absolutely, Hannah. <laughs> Rolling down Brush Mountain in a little wagon, no legs, Lucas, as he was called, entered Blacksburg to sell pencils or beg for money on the streets. And Viola Lucas, Lucas's mother, made whiskey, some say. Neither worked steady jobs, it seems. In the early 1940s, the Lucas family acquired a Model T coupe, later adding a small bed for hauling hay. Driving along roadsides, they cut hay and sold it. The elder Lucas laid sticks to operate the auto or used sticks to operate the automobile. It is not clear when the father died of pneumonia, but his passing was reportedly hastened by his wife. Their son told authorities he hated his mother because she said derogatory things and lied about his father. In 1960, while visiting Mrs. Lucas's daughter in Tecumseh, Michigan, Lucas and his mother argued about returning to Blacksburg. It may have been his hatred toward her that drove him to stab his 74-year-old mother to death. Convicted of her murder, Lucas spent six years at a state hospital for the criminally insane in Michigan, then was returned to prison and released on parole in 1970. Knives played an important part in Lucas's not life. A teacher recalls a pocket knife with a large blade he carried as a youngster. Whenever he had trouble with any of the other kids, he showed them the knife, she says. At some point, Lucas's brother stabbed him in the right eye. Some say it happened in the fifth grade, others say it was earlier. The false eye was a source of ter terror to some of Lucas's contemporaries. I never will forget him taking that glass eye out and rolling it around in his hand, says Gilbert Hale, a classmate at Mount Tabor. The school was closed in the early 1960s and converted into apartments. Uh, Charlie A.G., 47, the same age as Lucas, said the convicted killer was always a loner who beat and choked other kids on the playground. Although small for his age, Lucas was older and taller than most of the other children in his grade level because he repeatedly failed to pass on to higher classes. Not everyone saw Lucas as a mean kid. Anne, Annie Hall, his first and second grade teacher, said Lucas was a very humble little boy. He wasn't aggressive in the least, she recalls. He was a little slow and very dirty. Miss Hall says she saw no indications that Lucas would become a killer. With some kids, you can tell as early as six that they are full of fire, but Henry Lee, no. Lucas told authorities his first murder victim was a Blacksburg teacher who spurned his sexual advances, but an investigation did not substantiate the, his claim. In 1962, students at Mount Tabor were transferred to Gilbert Linkus Elementary, but Lucas had dropped out of school before then at age 15. He still had not finished the fifth grade. In 1971, while on parole, Lucas was returned to prison for attempting to kidnap two young girls in Michigan. He was released in 1975. He went to Jacksonville, Florida, where he teamed up with Otis Elwood Toole. The two wandered through the South working odd jobs. 
In 1980, Toole went to a Florida state institution and got custody of his orphaned 13-year-old niece, Frida Lorraine Powell. Toole later confessed to killing six-year-old Adam Walsh, whose head, severed from his body, was found floating in, the Vero Beach, in a Vero Beach, Florida canal in 1981. The trio lived and traveled together and until the girl and Lucas took off together, ending up in Texas. In May 1982, the couple were living in a small Texas town near Austin with 80-year-old 80 80 Katie Rich. In October 1983, Lucas was arrested by the sheriff of Montague County, Texas, who suspected Lucas was involved in the disappearance of Mrs. Rich. On October 17, while sitting in his cell, Lucas looked up at his jailer and said, uh, Joe Don, I've done some bad things. The elderly woman who just uh, the elderly woman was just one of a string of victims Lucas claims to have strangled or stabbed. At one time he told investigators of killing as many as 300 during his travels through the southern states. Later the number changed to more than 100. Most were hitchhikers or women he chanced upon, he said. In one interview with police he admitted having sex with their corpses. Um Yeah. I don't seem to have the continuation of this article, and so I'm just not going to even start the quote. Um, exactly! Was not worth it. Absolutely! How much does anyone remember about someone in their first grade class from 40 years ago? <laughs> now, I, I, admittedly, it was probably a much smaller, they, this is a rural school district, this was a three-room school, um, they were probably in class with the same people for many years in a row, and you would remember the kid who had been held back multiple times, like, he dropped out at 15 and hadn't passed fifth grade, so, uh, like, he was still listed as being in the first grade when he was nine. Um, so that would be a memorable person, as, and if they were a bully, you might remember them, but you really wouldn't remember details. You would just remember that they were a bully and that they were old and had been held back. And your details might be really far from the truth. Um, but yeah. Printing an unsubstantiated rumor of hitting on a teacher, yeah. The, the, we could critique um, the, uh, news uh, approach to reporting on this uh, true crime story. Um, so you'll recall one of the articles that we saw said he had been sentenced to death by lethal injection. Uh, here we have an article from 1998. Um, from the Roanoke Times, Saturday, June 27th, 1998, uh, where we get some context about why um, he died in prison, uh, but not by lethal injection. <clears throat> Austin, Texas. Henry Lee Lucas, the one-eyed drifter once considered among the nation's most prolific serial killers ever, was spared from, death, spared from the death chamber Friday after Governor George W. Bush accepted a state parole board recommendation. Bush commuted Lucas's death sentence to life in prison because of lingering doubts about his guilt in the so-called orange socks slaying. Bush's decision in no way gives any chance of freedom to Lucas, a Montgomery County, Virginia native who grew up on Brush Mountain. He still faces six other life sentences and 210 years in prison for nine other murders. The state board recommended Thursday that Lucas, who confessed to 600 killings nationwide but later recanted, not be executed Tuesday as scheduled. In separate votes, the board advised Bush to give Lucas a 270-day reprieve and to commute the death sentence to a lesser penalty. The first question I ask in each death penalty case is whether there is any doubt about whether the individual is guilty of the crime, Bush said. While Henry Lee Lucas is guilty of committing a number of horrible crimes, serious concerns have been raised about his guilt in this case, the governor said. 
Lucas, who has been convicted of 10 murder cases, was condemned in 1984 for the rape and strangulation of a woman whose body, nude but for a pair of orange socks, was found in a ditch off Interstate 35 north of Austin. Although Lucas confessed, he later said he was lying, and an investigation by former Attorney General Jim Maddox raised questions about Lucas's guilt. The parole board's decision pleased Lucas and his supporters, who say he could have he could have who say he couldn't have killed the unidentified woman known as, only as Orange Socks. It shows there is some justice in Texas, Lucas said from death row near Huntsville. Williamson County District Attorney Ken Anderson, who helped put Lucas on death row, said he was a monster who undoubtedly killed Orange Socks. Lucas left Virginia in 1959 after getting out of prison in Richmond for what he described as breaking and entering and stealing stuff. In 1960, he was convicted of killing his 74-year-old mother, Viola Lucas, during a drunken brawl between the two while she visited him in, in Michigan. In a 1996 newspaper interview, Lucas said, he should, uh, said that should he ever convince authorities he did not commit any of the murders he confessed to, he'd like to return to Virginia and rebuild his family's old home place on Brush Mountain. I'd be back in Virginia. That's where I want to be for the rest of my life, is in Virginia. <clears throat> Sounds like he started having second thoughts about his credibility when he got to 600 and <laughs> felt the need to start backpedaling. Yeah. Uh, wow. This was one, um, one of the items in our collections that I think I had heard mentioned, but I had never actually looked at this stuff myself. Because um, we occasionally get uh, researchers or students who will come in and they're just, um, they want to know any true crime or murder. In fact, this semester we had somebody who um, was requesting uh, any material we had on, um, I think, serial killers or murderers in the U.S., uh, or North America, possibly. I don't remember the exact request, but it was something that this this would have been relevant to. Um, and we don't go out of our way to collect true crime. It's just that that was a local story, and we collect local stuff. So we have been looking at that for about a half an hour. I'm going to move on to something else. So, because it's Ask an Archivist Day, and because I had planned to pull this at some point this month anyway, let's talk a little bit about what I'm about to show you, if I can find it. Let me see uh, which folder it's going to be in. Um, this is the John Holiday Diaries and Photographs. And uh, I think I remember the finding aid for this one said it was in the photographs. So let me pull the photographs from here and we'll see if I can find what I'm looking for. All right. I don't have gloves with me, so I have to be careful because I forgot to bring them upstairs, but I don't think this collection is going to need them anyway. Yeah. OK. So one of the things that we constantly get for Ask an Archivist Day, uh, one of the things people ask about Oh, no, it's, uh, I don't believe it's Doc Holiday. no, f flew down. Uh, let me, I can read you the biographical information from the finding aid just one second while I find the finding aid. Um, come on, where is Holiday? <clears throat> yeah, 
John Holliday was a non-commissioned officer in Company C, 91st Ohio Volunteer Infantry Regiment. He joined the regiment in spring 1864. Uh, during his service, he was promoted from corporal to sergeant before mustering out. The 91st Ohio was organized at Camp Ironton, Ohio in August 1862 and mustered into service the next month. The regiment served briefly in the Ohio River Valley before transferring operations to West Virginia's Kanawha River, uh, Kanawha River Valley during winter 1862 and spring 1863. Apart from a brief foray into Ohio, the 91st spent mo most of the remainder of 1863 and early 1864 in West Virginia. After s spring 1864 and until the close of the war, it operated in Virginia's New River and Shenandoah Valleys, where it was mustered out in June 1865. During Holiday's term of service, the regiment lost 63 men to battle and 90 to disease. Holiday survived, returning to his home in June 1865. So uh, let's end Holiday's diaries, the first covering 1st of May through 8th of August 1864, and the second covering uh, 1 September 1864 through 4 July 1865, begin with the regiment's entry into Virginia's New River Valley and conclude with his return to Ohio at the conclusion of the war. Holiday includes information on his participation in action and around the New River Valley, including the battles of Cloyd's Mountain and New River Bridge. Uh, also includes four photographs believed to be of Holiday and one of his wife. Two of the images have locks of hair under the glass and several have hand-painted details added. Uh, so, <clears throat> not Doc Holliday, this is um, a, a soldier named John Holliday who served in the Union Army in the Civil, the American Civil War. Um, but the reason I pulled this for today, for the spooky stuff and the creepy stuff, and I'm zooming in rather than out, um, is the human hair. Um, I don't see, I only see human hair in one of these photographs. The finding aid says there should be hair in two of them, but I'm only seeing it in one of them. Um, regardless, let's talk about hair. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm going to throw this to you. Why is there hair in this collection? Oh, there's the other hair. Two, two locks of human hair. Uh, can you see them? <laughs> Fluid and they're, um, these are from the Civil War. They would not have known about DNA back then. Oh, I don't have the light on. Maybe that will help. No, that made it worse. <laughs> Indeed, Hannah, um, hair was a keepsake. It was a way to remember a loved one. Uh, really common during like the Victorian era, um, which dates of... Oh, come on. Uh, Victorian era, roughly 1837 to 1901. It was used in jewelry for a while. I did not know that. Um, but so we've got quite a few collections with locks of human hair in them. Um, and so here, I don't know who the individuals in these two photographs are, uh, but you can see that the gentleman here, uh, there's, there's the photo and under the glass, there is a lock of his hair. And then the, the woman in this photo, again, the photograph of her and behind the glass, a lock of her hair. Um, and even today, people do still collect human hair. Uh, generally today, it is just for, um, like parents will keep a lock of their baby's hair. Um, 
and that's about the extent of hair collection that happens today. But uh, some of them are, are rather interesting that you find. This one makes a lot of sense. It's like two little pictures, and they've got some hair in them. Some of these are not quite so straightforward as to uh, expecting to find hair. One second. My cart is very full, and I don't want to mess anything up. All right, I have a large box. Hair jewelry, often called hair work, often used in memorial jewelry. Okay, so here I have a ledger. This is a very large ledger. I'm not sure, like I can zoom out as far as I can go and you're still not gonna be able to see the whole thing uh, just because I have a small document camera. But we have a ledger. This ledger is, it's just called Christiansburg, Virginia Store Ledger. So I'm going to remove it from here. Well, actually, I'm going to leave it partly in the box right now. Give me one second while I see if I can locate the hair that is in here. Because there is human hair in this ledger. according to the finding aid. I have never looked at this ledger before, so I don't actually know. I wish I could show you what I'm seeing, but this is taller. When open, this is taller than the camera. Um, so bear with me for one second while I look for the hairs. I hope everybody is having a good Wednesday today. Well, I found some pressed flowers. Once I get a setup that has a, a camera that is able to go higher, I do hope to revisit some of these things that I want to share that are just too big um, for the current setup. Where is the hair? Aha, here we go. There's quite, quite a few little locks of hair in here. So this ledger is from a store in Christiansburg, Virginia. I can't show you like the entire uh, page here, but I will let you all look at the little locks of hair. And there is a poem pasted in that I will read to you in a moment. Uh, so there are little, there are names written in cursive next to each of the little locks of hair. Um, they are a bit difficult for me to read at the moment, so I'm, I'm just not going to try. But uh, Stella's Hair by Iserlon. Among Dean Swift's papers, there was found one containing a lock of the gentle Stella's hair on which was written in the Dean's hand the words, only a woman's hair. Only a woman's hair faded and old, dropped by the years in their flight. Yet a story is hid in its silken fold of a past that is buried from sight. A story that tells of a struggling heart, a great intellect dark with despair. Did he find a light from the world apart in the gleam of a woman's hair? Only a woman's hair, all that is left, a faded and frail little token of a heart that was slowly of hope bereft and at last in its faithfulness broken. Only a woman's hair, no word at all, of a love that so faithfully yearned, did it seem to him but a trifle small to be carelessly treasured or spurned? So, uh... 
Th this ledger is not about hair. The description in here, uh, let's see. Charles B. Gardner, likely owner of this ledger, was born in Virginia on August 10th, 1813. He married Mary J. L. Miller, born in 1817, died 1873, and the couple had six children. The 1840 census shows Gardner living in Montgomery County, Virginia, and owning two, and he enslaved two people. In the 1850 census, Gardner is described as a 36-year-old merchant living in Christiansburg with his wife and family. The Gardners reported uh, enslaving three people that year. Gardner was active in the business community of Christiansburg and Eastern Montgomery County. In 1842, he was named one of the directors of the Lafayette and Ingalls Ferry Turnpike Company, and in 1853, he was among a group of businessmen who purchased the nearby Yellow Sulphur Springs Resort. He also served as cashier of Christiansburg's Bank of the Valley of Virginia and is identified as a bank cashier in the 1860 census. Uh, the collection consists of a single ledger maintained by an unidentified store in Christiansburg, Virginia in 1856. Entries in the volume spanning March through September 1856 provide customer names and transaction totals. Evidence suggests the ledger may have belonged to Charles Gardner. Uh, the ledger was later used as a scrapbook apparently by Christiansburg teacher Eugenia V. Sullivan. Among the items that are preserved in the volume are a souvenir from the International Cotton Exposition in Atlanta, um, prose and poetry clipped from various newspapers, a Christmas card published by S. Uh, Hildesheimer, a sewing pattern fragment, a calling card from Talent and Company of Christiansburg, several locks of hair, botanical specimens, and transcriptions of published poems. So it's a store ledger that a school teacher later took over and used as a scrapbook and added locks of hair for various persons. So not exactly what you expect to find when you're looking through an old store ledger, but not as creepy as it might seem. Although I will say human hair, there's a fascination with it for people who visit the archives, uh, just to know that we have hair <laughs> in collections that you could just randomly come across. Um, let's see. I have more examples of human hair if you want to, to see more of them. But I also have other things, so feel free to, you know, direct me to move on if you want less human hair or, um, like I said, anything from Edgar Allan Poe that you might want me to read, I can certainly do. Uh, I have that. I don't know which folder it's in here. Let me... Financial documents, photographs, ephemera. Maybe it's in the ephemera folder. Aha, uh -huh. yep, okay. Here we have a lock of hair that was not tied, so it was loose in the collection and has been put into a little plastic envelope here. This collection is the Vivian Coleman Bear Papers. I'm just going to find the finding aid here. Uh, I think it is on the first page of results. Vivian Coleman Bear Papers. Vivian Clemens Coleman, the daughter of Harriet Hattie Stanley and Lee Coleman, was born January 7th, 
1888. The family seems to have been living in Kentucky when Coleman was born, but by 1900 she was living with her aunt Alma Stanley Crouch in Roanoke, Virginia. Coleman continued to live in Roanoke after marrying Charles Edgar Bear, the son of John Henry and Lizzie Stevens Bear. Bear, who attended Virginia Polytechnic Institute, Roanoke College, and the University of North Carolina, later worked in both the lumber and automobile business. The couple had no children. Vivian Coleman Bear died in Roanoke on October 17, 1984. So this is an unidentified lock of hair. We do not know whose hair this is. <laughs> Key squared. Um, I am looking at collections with human hair in them. Um, yeah, this one, we, we don't know whose hair it is. It's a, a pretty decently sized lock of a blonde hair. Um, we don't know the name of the person that it belonged to. And it is accompanied by a poem titled Despair. So unidentified human hair among these papers paired with a poem titled Despair. Softly the moonbeams glimmer over the woodland and plain, but my soul is heavy with sorrow and the tears are falling like rain. As I clasp my fingers tightly, the wailing and bitter cry comes up from the depths of my spirit. Oh, would that I might die. Once my heart was tender and love was the joy of my life. You folded me closely to you. You asked me to be your wife. Then I was trusting and happy, and I never can be again, for in this world-weary bosom is buried a sleepless pain. So we don't know whose hair it is, but possibly a former lover, given the context provided by the poem. I don't know. Um, I do have more, <laughs> if you're not over the hair yet, I've got, I've got this one. Uh, here is a diary from Alva Cleveland. And let me see what I know about Alva Cleveland. <clears throat> Alva Cleveland was born in Cherry Valley, New York, to Philo and Hannah Miller Cleveland, uh, born in 1805. In 1831, he married Maria Austin uh, in Scantonelles, New York. They had eight children, Elvira, Edwin, Elvin, Mary, Henry Harrison, Emma, Sarah Marie, and George Washington. Between 1836 and 1840, the family moved to Cook County, Illinois. By 1849, they relocated to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It appears to have worked for the Postal Service in Wisconsin. Uh, they enlisted in, for, to the Union during the Civil War. All right. The collection contains Alva Cleveland's diary from March to July, 1862. In the back pocket of the diary are several sewing needles and a lock of brown hair. Again, unidentified hair. You had a camping journal bound in this style, newer and hairless, however. <laughs> Interesting key squared. I've seen a number of these in our collections. Um, uh, journals that were bound this way. Um, we have a few of them. 
Um, and so in the pocket is where the hair was. Uh, also some sewing needles, which I don't know if they're still in here. Yep, there are still sewing needles in here. Still wrapped in paper, McCrowley and Son gold inlaid sharps, patented 1851. <clears throat> I am not going to open the package of sewing needles because I don't need to stick myself with some really old sewing needles. You tried to make your own ink, own oak gall ink to write in it, but it never really worked very well. That sounds amazing, he squared. Uh, just the act of trying to learn how to make your own ink sounds awesome. Um, so yeah, a lock of brown hair. We do not know whose hair it is, again. Clearly somebody who um, Alva really wanted to remember. But considering this is a journal from his time in the Union Army, that person could have been somebody in his family at home. That person could have been somebody he served alongside. Uh, that person could have been somebody he met while they were on maneuvers. We have no idea. But again, hair. Because that was a thing people did to remember people. that apparently we find creepy today. Let's see. I have some things that I can't read to you in full because they are too new, but that I wanted to share because they're just too cute. <laughs> uh, so from our rare books collection, I pulled a few things, shining, gleaming, streaming, flax and waxen. Oh yes, the lyrics from the musical Hair, if you are unfamiliar with it. Um, good reference, Key Squared. My brain was going to Sweeney Todd, which also has a song about hair, but a much creepier song about hair. Uh, so here, we have a cookbook. Because uh, if you've watched previously, you know that we collect materials on the history of food and drink, as well as the history of the American cocktail. Um, the reason I pulled this cookbook is that it's illustrated by Edward Gorey. A very distinctive art style. This is the Son of the Martini Cookbook by Jane Trahey, nay Baba Erlinger, and Darren Pierce. And it has this the most adorable little bat carrying the Son of the Martini, apparently, on the front cover here. Gory's wings are awesome. Gory, just Gory's art is really nice. Uh, I'm going to adjust the camera here one second, sorry. And we have a few things, not much, but we had a couple of things in our collections from um, Gory. So I had to share. You get um, the bios on the authors. Jane Trahey, nay Baba Erlinger, is 34 and unmarried. She lives in a blackstone house on the south shore of Manhattan Island. She is a devotee of deep sea drinking and some, is sometimes gone for months at a time. Somewhat of a recluse, she has a penchant for red spotted newts. Uh, okay, there is an asterisk on that. Dimictalus Viridensis, Viridensis. 
If you want to know what red spotted newts are, you can look up Vermictilus viridensis de, 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 uh, viridensis viridensis which she says are infinitely more amusing than most people at cocktail parties. She has just completed her first book of Somali poetry entitled Somali and the World Somalis with You. Cry and you cry alone. And the other author, Darren Pierce, is 34 and unmarried. He is the inventor of the game Cachet, which has had such a fantastic run here and abroad, and also finds time in his busy schedule to drink more than most people can with far less to do. He began the uh, Derdegarde movement when he was 10, and since then has built it into a network of clubs from San Francisco to New Guinea. He is today recognized as a major drinker and divides his time between day and night, often covering all major brunches, luncheons, cocktail parties, champagne parties, Punch parties, bon voyage parties, midnight suppers, sunrise services. He is intellectual, witty, detached, and quite sloshed most of the time. I will note at this time, <clears throat> this is a book, a cocktail recipe book, that was published in some period of time. If I can find an actual date... 1967, uh, at a time when the conversation about alcoholism and binge drinking was not in the same place that it is today. So um, the humor here about overdrinking is a little overdone. As, as I have noted multiple times and will continue to do on this channel, the things shared here are historical documents and do not necessarily reflect the knowledge and attitudes of today. The art reminds you of where the sidewalk ends. Um, yeah, kind of a similar style, I think. That's definitely not gory, but um, I think my favorite Edward Gorey is the, the 12 Nightmares of Christmas. Um, I believe that's the title. Um, which just it's a take on the 12 days of Christmas, but it is um, done in this sort of art style. I'm now just double checking <clears throat> the title. Uh, it's the t 12 terrors of Christmas, I believe. Yes, the Twelve Terrors of Christmas, um, and I, my family did not necessarily appreciate when I sent them Christmas cards with the illustrations from the Twelve Terrors of Christmas, but I thought they were wonderful. Um, anyway, uh, here is, I used this illustration as part of our um, graphic for this episode today. Um, just because I love it. It's great. Two little bats carrying a pie. Um, <clears throat> then we have acknowledgments. And then we get a forward. We're still not to the actual like content of the, the book yet. Forward. Actually, Baba and I started out to compile a new book called Cooking for the Wrong Set, or What the Ugly People Are Eating. But upon arriving home from any of the numerous parties we attend every single night, we discovered the typewriter ribbon was a but a memory. Since we cannot possibly translate the, our writing the following morning, a gala search was immediately put into effect for a new ribbon, which was bound to be in our old tortoise box or in the, or in the Bavarian cup. Well, that in itself is a game to play on a rainy day. We finally found it pressed between the pages of Roger's Thesaurus, where we always keep it and always forget about it. The fun was just starting. Personally, we think the game that can replace personally, we think the game that can replace Scrabble, the Watusi post office, or sex is trying to replace a typewriter ribbon after five martinis. Baba was certain that Olivetti had an emergency service for drunk writers, so a lot of our time was spent on the phone calling Milan, the home office of Olivetti. Uh, 
At least we knew they were up at this hour sobering up. In any event, we did not write cooking for the wrong set, since Mama, Cousin Esther, and just about everyone we know is bored with being served up fuzzled fancies, loafers loaf, or lovers loaf, noodles Marmaduke, and Opal Cassini's Cartier Chowder, all from the father of this book. The Complete Martini Cookbook. We decided it was high time, cocktail hour, to add additional recipes to, so that you can once again win with gin. Actually, we are very serious because fried is one of the nine basic ways of cooking, and so is boiled. Alice B. Toklas you only used ha uh, Alice B. Toklas only used hashish, and Fanny Farmer probably didn't even touch the sherry. Of course, sherry probably didn't touch her either, but that's where the fun begins. May I repeat as an old Egan Pierce, my uncle once said, Gin, white pearl, beyond price, there'll be no sand, grouse grilled here tonight. I do not know. I get some of that. I don't get all of it. Then we finally get the title page, Son of the Martini Cookbook. And this cookbook comes with instructions. How to use our cookbook. If you would get the greatest use and inspiration from this cookbook and save yourself many precious minutes, we, you should use our index freely. Asterisk, we have had to omit the index because there are no page numbers. When planning the index, we tried to think of every way in which you might look for recipes. Then we arranged the listings so you can locate what you need as quickly as possible. If you're looking for, if you're looking up a recipe and you can remember the name, all the recipes in the book, there are less than 10, are listed by name alphabetically. You'll find Frugagogo, Guy, wait, you'll find Frugagogo Gaipan under F and also under Contemporary Chinese or C, and you'll find Pack Up Your Truffles. Um, under P, not under T. Under T, however, you'll find Nobody Knows the Truffles I've Seen, and this will save the night in case you've opened a can of truffles. If you're a beginner drinker, remember that sometime this, that evening you must eat whether anyone else does or not. Cooking was once considered an art for which you needed a certain flair and a good measure of luck. Things have not changed one iota, however, due to our methods and procedures, timing and handling of guests. You can fry while completely frazzled, gastronomize while guzzling, and remember, the more you eat, the more you can drink. Do not tamper with good recipes. These have been tested over and over and over in Darren Pierce's kitchen and in Baba Erlinger's outdoor drinking pit. And we warn you, do not, under any conditions, change the ingredients. Do not try to fit a six egg souffle into a one quart dish, even if the other drinkers in your kitchen say it can be done. This is not a book on how to prepare tantalizing party dishes that revive the all but lost art of great cookery. This is a book designed especially for those hosts and hostesses who are too drunk to crawl to a restaurant or even the corner discotheque. We have not covered the party menus from hors d'oeuvres to desserts from, or from soups to salads. This is a collection of recipes that are a delight to the starving palate, but not necessarily a joy to behold. There is an element of surprise in every one of these recipes, and you will find that people do not mind an upside down cake right side up if you will just stop drinking long enough to serve it. This is not the same kind of cuisine that anyone will prepare, prepare soberly at home or could possibly find in a restaurant or at grandma's house, unless she has a copy of this book too. As you serve our dishes, you may not be the prettiest cook ever seen, but you will be the most welcome. Our recipes are not des de destined to set American gastronomy ahead by light years, but they may see you to your bed. Uh... Let's look at one or two of the recipes. How about? Got macaroni, souffle. Poisson. Okay. I think this one is worth looking at because the title does not match the ingredients. 
After five martinis, another man's poisson. Kneaded, tablespoon, teaspoon, measuring cup, buttered casserole. Ingredients, cream of celery soup, or a can of cream of celery soup, a package of frozen shrimp, a package of frozen peas, one egg yolk, just let the white rum right, just let the white run right down the drain, one teaspoon lemon juice, some cut up ripe olives, some chopped almonds, optional. Stir the egg yolk into the celery soup and then add the other ingredients. Place in a buttered casserole, dot with butter, and bake for 30 minutes in a 350 degree oven. The reason I had to read that was because it's titled Another Man's Poisson. And if you know your French, or if you know your Disney songs, you know that poisson is French for fish. And there is no fish in this dish. There are shrimp, which are not fish. They're crustaceans, which are not fish. So I just had to stop and read it because the ingredients don't actually include any fish, but it is called another man's fish. Anyway. Tuna bake. Oh, here's a lovely one. We're going to try this, I think. Yes. The late, late show off a la boiled egg. After seven, or was it eight? Uh, oh, it couldn't be eight martinis. They misspelled drunk, drunken poisson. <laughs> there was something fishy about that recipe. <laughs> Do you think you're up to boiling an egg? There isn't too much danger other than first degree burns. The only other alternative is if you forgot to serve that plate of stuffed eggs in the refrigerator. They can be used with much the same effect. If you have the strength, flip this page down. Needed. Can opener, toaster, a selection of pots and pans. Ingredients, can condensed cheddar cheese soup. Cream of celery will suffice in a pinch. Half a cup of milk, some pimento, if you have some, otherwise paprika. Four slices of bread, four eggs, or the leftover stuffed ones. If you are boiled, but the eggs are not, place the eggs in a saucepan and cover with cold water. Put the lid on and rapidly bring to a boil. Turn down the heat and let them cook for four minutes, then remove from heat and let them stand for 15 minutes. If you can still stand, set the table or wash the fingerprints off the refrigerator or mix another drink or do something during this period while the eggs harden. Never rush a hard boiled egg. Combine the soup and milk in another saucepan Blending until smooth, steal yourself and peel the eggs. If by any remote chance the eggs didn't cook, give yourself a facial and send everyone else home. If they are as they should be, slice them and add to the other saucepan along with the pimento. Heat and stir and stir and heat. Let the toaster be working on the bread during this time. So when everything is good and toasted and good and hot, get them together on a plate and at least it's better than nothing. So this book, while being a recipe book that was written with a certain sense of humor, is also an experience, which is sort of my understanding of Edward Gorey illustrated items. It's more about the illustrations than it is about the content. Uh, here we have Thu Ika F. Tur, otherwise known as the week after. Do not go to work. Do not read. Do not watch television. Do not comb hair. Bathe a lot. Do not answer the telephone. Do not pay bills. Do not take off dark glasses. 
do not go near children, send dog to friends in the country. And the bats are taking the dog away. I didn't know that was going to be on the back. Have Beckett, All Strange Away, Gotham Bookmark Master Series, edited by Andreas Brown, Samuel Beckett, All Strange Away, Long on the Humor, Short on the Recipes, at least usable ones. I just hope they had it in the right section of the book bookstore. Yeah, I don't know what's not worth it. I don't know where they decided to sell it. I think it belongs in humor and not recipes, um, but it is cooking and cocktail related, so it belongs in our collections. Illustrated by Edward Gorey. Nineteen seventy six Samuel Beckett first edition from our rare books. So I'm not going to read this despite it being super short, just because 1976 is not old enough to me, for me to read an entire thing. Um, it has, all the illustrations are little squares. And they're very abstract, not like specific images. They're like sections or windows on images. Quite interesting. Like I said, I pull things and I see them often for the same, at the same time as you. <laughs> like I had not seen that before. This one I have glanced through. A toy theater, Dracula. The sets and costumes of the Broadway production of the play designed by Edward Gorey. So many bats. So this is copyright 1979 by Edward Gorey. Um, A dramatization of the novel by Hamilton Dean premiered in London on February 14, 1927. In October of 1927, the play appeared on Broadway in a slightly different version with John L. Balderston as a collaborator and starred the romantic Hungarian actor Bela Lugosi, who recreated his role in the film Dracula, released in 1931. The sets and costumes in this book were created by Edward Gorey for the production of Dracula, which opened on Broadway October 20th, 1977. I like sharing them. I just, I would love to be able to read more of them. It's just, unless it's prior to 1926, I can't be sure that I can read the entire thing. So I could read like a chapter or part of something, but unless it was from before 1926, I can't read the whole thing. Uh, and that is because of US copyright law and me not wanting to run afoul of it. Um, instructions, cut out and assemble the furniture and floors, removing all pages except the walls. Then set up the book with stiff cardboard between the walls of th the three sets. Tape with scotch tape along top and sides. Floors can be pasted on heavier cardboard. Cut out the characters and glue small supports to the backs as indicated. Your own production of Dracula with sets and costume designed by Edward Gorey is about to begin. So it's a little book for kids or honestly anybody um, to create their own 
Broadway production of Dracula. Uh, and it has on the pages things to be cut out um, where you can get, you've got the book standing up as the walls. You have a couch, a bed, a tomb, and people. Oh, Gory won a Tony for best costume design for that Dracula production. I did not know that. Very few Edward Gorey works are from, yeah. <laughs> he wasn't quite, um, he, he may not be a, uh, an immortal being who is a pyramid. Um, he is just Edward Gorey, a wonderful illustrator and um, yeah. So you get the cast, the scenes, a synopsis of the three act play. And then you get the pages. So this is um, one half of the floor. So you're meant to cut this out. It says you can paste it onto some heavy cardboard if you want, uh, but that's part of the floor. And you've got one of the walls here. So you would leave this kind of open to this page. And uh, when you actually set up the model, you would have three segments. Uh, so you would have it so that it stands sort of like this. Uh, I think I think you can see it down in the corner here. I can also switch it so that you've got the full face cam. Um, so you see how I've got like three segments and it's standing on its own. That's how it's meant to be set up. Um, so that you get, and I'm not going to do it because it would require removing pages and doing the stuff, but um, these inter, inter, these pages would no longer be there. And so you would have this wall illustration here and this wall illustration here um, forming the backdrop of a set or a scene for the book. It's really quite clever to make um, like an interactive experience for kids. Um, I think it's pretty awesome. Hi, Millie Glitch. How are you today? It reminds me of some of the um, some of the like Victorian era board games. Um, and early, early board games. Uh, this kind of reminds me of that in some ways. Um, that is an area that I would very much love to collect. <laughs> Unfortunately, we do not currently collect that. Um, and th these are the cutouts for the characters. And here's the couch meant to be cut out and then folded to um, the little tabs fold in to make a three-dimensional couch. You have a library rug to put on the floor. All you have to do is cut it out. <laughs> this is um, Edward Gorey's A Toy Theater Dracula, the sets and costumes of the Broadway production of the play designed by Edward Gorey. He designed um, sets and costumes for Dracula on Broadway in 1977. Um, and this book is meant for kids to be able to just like cut it out and set up their own like three-dimensional mini theater. Um, <laughs> I guess also for like grown kids, like people of all ages who enjoy the theater and would find this amusing and interesting. Plus, I just love Edward Gorey. Here you've got the bed. Again, a cutout uh, meant to be turned into a three-dimensional thing. You have the boudoir rug. Uh, and then we get another of the walls. Mm 
wall and floor. Another part of the floor. People again. Here we have the tomb meant to be cut out and folded to turn it into a 3D item. And that's basically the book um, on the back. A toy theater. This book is based on the sets and costumes created by Edward Gorey for his award-winning Broadway production of Dracula. Soaring spectacular settings. Spiffy staging with marvelous gothic scenery and costumes. The kids will love it. These are just some of the rave reviews that greeted Edward Gorey's sets and costumes for the recent Broadway production based on Bram Stoker's world-famous novel. This book contains adaptations of the three sets for the play with furnishings which can easily be cut out and assembled, along with the play's eight characters and other appropriately atmospheric details. Also included is a brief story synopsis so that you can stage your very own miniature production of, the cl of this classic vampire, s vampire tale. Edward Gorey is author and illustrator of over 30 books, the first editions of which are available only at rare book prices. His elegantly styled body of gothic work has won him a worldwide following. Published by Charles Scribner's Sons, New York. And this sold for $8.95. I think it's pretty awesome. Uh, okay. Let's... I'm just going to randomly pull from my cart. I have fear. Volume 1, numbers 1 and 2, May through July, 1960. This is from our uh, speculative fiction collection. Oh, when was the Dracula thing published? Um, 1979, so two years after the production on Broadway was mounted. So it's 42 years old. That book was 42 years old. All right, so I have two issues of fear. This is uh, from our rather extensive pulp sci-fi collection, a rather large pulp sci-fi collection. Uh, issues. What did it say? This is volume one, numbers one and two. And I enjoy looking at these. I'm going to have to do another episode on um, the Pulp Sci-Fi Collection sometime just because the first one happened on January 6th um, during events at the U.S. Capitol and even the people who were here to moderate and help me run the ch like the very first ever stream were not paying attention. So we have, uh, let's see, Deus Ex Machina by Martin Weingarten, Dust to Dust by Alfred Schneider, Josephus by Arthur Porges, the Vandal by Evelyn Goldstein, Stein. Uh, the Black Sa Sadu by Theodore Matheson. Nightquake by Pat Rogers. The Dream Woman by Wilkie Collins. The Rainy Night by Hal Elson. Of Harry Snakes by Pat Remlick. The Girl Who Was God by Newell Bixby. Haven for the Damned by Robert Cassidy. Vortex by William Jukes. If I Die Before I Wake by Peter Gund and The Strange Paintings of Felix A. Orth by John Jakes. Let's see. 118, maybe? Or if somebody's got one that sounds interesting, 
let me know. If I Die Before I Wake by Peter Gund. Today is blue and gold, a swimming cloud curls up around the sun like a white wave, crossing the bathroom window mirrored now in the misted glass that tells me where to shave. Downstairs, the radio gives us an account of the latest H-bomb test. So many megatons of instant blazing pain or secret gamma rays that subtly gnaw the brain, such deft new ways of death. It is a day to savor fresh hot toast with marmalade, hot coffee, and my wife. Across the table, surely here's the most a man can lawfully demand of life. The paper states new frying, new flying saucers seen. Can they have come from Mars? Will we be slaves to weird new monsters that can creep upon us unawares and take us while we sleep to serve in cosmic wars? The sunny morning wraps me as I pace down to the bus stop while the schoolward bound small fry rush past me, shouting as they race, their laughter spilling gaily all around. The rampant youth, they tell us, sounds our knell. Only doom lies ahead, for soon the teeming earth will be a swarming hell of starving, staggering, savage mobs whose bodies swell with hunger while their hearts shrivel with fear who'd sell their souls for moldy bread. Man walks in a wonderful, flowing world, shut up in his shell of dread. The mushroom cloud is etched in horror on his mind, and UFOs whirl madly round. The deadly wind of terror, fatal germ, or rampant star, or cosmic fiend, all there before but mercifully unknown, blows through the universe, opening around him on every hand. Through secret doors that one by one swing wide before him, all his puny heart can find is fear. John Jakes does sound familiar. That, yeah, that name sounds familiar, but I... Not personally familiar with uh, North and South or, like, I'm not a huge fan of Westerns. My dad watched a lot of Westerns, so I've seen some of them, but I... I don't know specifically. <clears throat> and so the second issue, Tales of the Terror-Filled Unknown, Fear. Behind his quiet mask, madness festers, and two women are fated to die with the night. The veiled woman, she ate not flesh, nor drank of blood, yet slowly drained his life away. Bonus novelette, the Robert Hitchens Fear Classic. North and South. The TV, TV adaptation was very popular in Germany. I did not know this. Let's see. In issue, or volume one, number two, we have Confession by James Harvey, Account Closed by David Mason, The Veiled Woman by Larry Bearson, The Cage by Bryce Walton, End with the Night by Donald Honig, Still Life by Mark Richards, The Persuader by Irving Schiffer, The Idol by Joe Mackey, Bourbon on a Champagne Carpet by Albert Bermel, and How Love Came to Professor Gildy by Robert Hitchens. So Robert Hitchens is definitely a known name. That's why they have a bonus novelette mentioned on the cover. Um, Joe Mackey sounds familiar as well. These don't immediately bring to life or bring to mind um, immediate, like, this is going to be a good horror story, like some of the ones in the first issue did. Um, but yeah, apparently there's a magazine that was called Fear that was published in the 60s. Um, I'm not going to read too much from it. I read one poem, which is probably more than I should have read because <laughs> it was not old enough. Um,
Now something I definitely can read. I love the old pulps too, was not worth it. Um, there were only ever two issues. I did not know that. Um, the, the collection that these are from, I can tell you about the collection. Um, and I will do another episode on the collection at some point. Uh, we may even have a couple of issues of things that are old enough for me to actually read, like fully read. Um, oh, come on. I know we have some items, I have some items on the cart here that are from 1927, <laughs> which is just slightly too new. Uh, for me to read the entire thing. Um, but I could look specifically for things that are older and old enough to read. And we can definitely, like, we can look at the art, we can do stuff like that um, and discuss it. I just don't want to, like, read full stories necessarily. Uh, let's see. So this is all part of a collection that is a named collection here. It is the William J. Heron Spe Speculative Fiction Collection. Between 1989 and 1994, Special Collections and University Archives acquired a significant collection of science fiction materials from William J. Heron, a private collector from North Carolina. Uh, the collection has more than 150 science fiction reference works, 11,000 paperback novels, and 4,500 issues from over 200 titles of British, Australian, and primarily American pulp magazines dating from the 1910s through the 1980s. They include the first public works of well-known science fiction and fantasy authors. Yeah, um, so this collection came to us uh, already in these boxes. These boxes were custom made to house the, the books. Um, and so they were already in these books. I, I imagine um, Heron, Heron just collected and did a very nice job of collecting them. Um, so not all of them are in that condition. Some of the ones like from um, the early, early, early 1900s are falling apart, um, which is not unexpected. These are these are pulp. They're not on quality paper. They are going to fall apart. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a really, really nice collection. It's actually one of the things that I was excited about when I came here because I think they're just spectacularly cool. Um, I've gotten to use them in instruction a couple of times. Uh, so I, I enjoy them. Um, all right, I think it's time. We've got about 15 minutes left. I think it's time for some Edgar Allan Poe. If somebody has a specific Edgar Allan Poe poem that you would like to hear, do let me know. Otherwise, I'm just going to pick something. Possible, possible, possible. I am, uh, the books that I'm looking at are the complete works of Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, this is the Book Lovers Arnhem edition. <clears throat> this edition of the complete works of Edgar Allan Poe is limited to 500 signed and numbered sets, of which this is number 418, uh, G.P. Putnam Sons, and these were published in... 19, uh, 1902. So I don't know specifically the best creepy poems from Poe, aside from the ones that everybody knows, like The Raven. Um, so I'm just, I'm right now looking at the contents lists in these books to see 
if something jumps out as being, hey, let's read that. Uh, ooh, OK, maybe. So nobody has jumped in with a specific title. I'm going to read The Devil in the Belfry because I don't know it and it sounds interesting. It's possible that they are in the public domain was not worth it. I have not. Um, I think that's one of the things I need to do next time I try to do a, um, a pulp sci-fi uh, episode. I need to actually put in some research ahead of time. Like usually this show is very impromptu. I pull things, we look at them together, and oftentimes I've not seen them before you do. Um, but for that, if I want to actually be able to read the stories, I need to do some copyright research ahead of time to make sure. Um, because a lot of the stuff that is older, like say 1920s, 1930s-ish, if the copyright has not been renewed, then it is in the public domain. It's just without checking, I have to stick to that 1926 date. Telltale Heart, probably longer than I would want to read. You think you've read The Devil in the Belfry. Well, I'm going to I'm gonna read The Devil in the Belfry today. We can always do The Telltale Heart next week because um, I will still have the Edgar Allan Poe stuff next week, and, and we're doing this stuff for the rest of the month. So um, <clears throat> let, me, let me take a quick sip of water before I start reading. The Devil in the Belfry. What o'clock is it? Old saying. Everybody knows in a general way that the finest place in the world is, or alas, was, the Dutch borough of van der Votes. One second. Van der Vote. Van der Vote mitis. Van der Vote mitis. <clears throat> I will start again because I'm going to have to learn to say this to read this. Von, van der Vote mitis. Van der Vote mitis. Van der Vote mitis. Van der Vote mitis. All right. Everybody knows in a general way that the finest place in the world is, or alas, was, the Dutch borough of Van der Vote mitis. Yet, as it lies some distance from any of the main roads, being in a somewhat out-of-the-way situation, there are perhaps very few of my readers who have ever paid it a visit. For the benefit of those who have not, therefore, it will be only proper that I should enter into some account of it, and that this is, indeed, the more necessary, as, with the hope of enlisting public sympathy in behalf of the inhabitants, I, de I design here to give a history of the calamitous events which have so lately occurred within its limits. No one who knows me will doubt that the duty thus self-imposed will be executed to the best of my ability. With all that rigid impartiality, all that cautious examination into facts and diligent collation of authorities which should ever distinguish him who aspires to the title of historian. By the united aid of medals, manuscripts, and inscriptions, I am enabled to say positively that the borough of van der Vitimitis has existed from its origin in precisely the same condition which it at present preser preserves. On the date of this origin, however, I grieve that I can only speak with that species of indefinite definiteness which mathematicians are, at times, forced to put up with in certain algebraic formulae. The date, I must, say the, I must thus say, in regard to the remoteness of its antiquity, cannot be less than any assignable quantity whatsoever. 
Touching the derivation of the name von der Vitimitis, I confess myself with sorrow equally at fault. Among a multitude of opinions upon this delicate point, some acute, some learned, some sufficiently the reverse, I am able to select nothing which ought to be considered satisfactory. Perhaps the idea of Grossvig, nearly coincident with that of Krauteplenty, is to be cautiously preferred. It runs, von der Vitimitis, von der, lege donner, donder, uh, votemitis, quasi und bleitzis, bleitzis obsol pro bleitzen. This derivation, to say the truth, is still countenanced by some traces of the electric fluid evident on the summit of the steeple of the House of the Town Council. I do not choose, however, to commit myself on a theme of such importance, or must refer the reader desirous of information to Oratiunculi de Rebus Praeterveteris of Dunderguts, see also Blunderbuzzard, Blunderbuzzard uh, de Derivationibus, Pages 27 to 5010, folio gothic edition, red and black character, catchword and no cipher, wherein consult also marginal notes in the autograph of Stoffenpuff with the sub commentaries of Gruntenguzel. Notwithstanding the obscurity which thus envelops the date of the foundation of von der Vitermittis, and the derivation of its name, there can be no doubt, as I said before, that it has always existed as we find it in this epoch. The oldest man in the borough can remember not the slightest difference in the appearance of any portion of it, and indeed the very suggestion of such a possibility is considered an insult. The site of the village is in a perfectly circular valley, about a quarter of a mile in circumference, and entirely surrounded by gentle hills, over whose summit the people have never yet ventured to pass. For this they assign the very good reason that they do not believe there is anything at all on the other side. Round the skirts of the valley, which is quite level and paved throughout with flat tiles, extends a continuous row of sixty little houses. These, having their backs on the hills, must look, of course, to the center of the plain, which is just sixty yards from the front door of each dwelling. Every house has a small garden before it, with a circular path, a sundial, and twenty-four cabbages. The buildings themselves are so precisely alike that one can in no manner be distinguished from the other. Owing to the vast antiquity, the style of architecture is somewhat odd, but it is not for that reason the less strikingly picturesque. They are fashioned of hard-burned little bricks, red with black ends, so that the walls look like a chessboard upon a great scale. The gables are turned to the front and there are cornices as big as all the rest of the house over the eaves and over the main doors. The windows are narrow and deep, with very tiny panes and a great deal of sash. On the roof is a vast quantity of tiles with long curly ears. The woodwork throughout is of a dark hue, and there is much carving about it, but with, a tr but a, uh, with but a trifling variety of pattern. For time out of mind, the carvers of von der Vittermittis have never been able to carve more than two objects, a timepiece and a cabbage. But these they do exceedingly well, and intersperse them with singular ingenuity wherever they find room for the chisel. The dwellings are as much alike inside and as out, and the furniture is all upon one plan. The floors are of square tiles, the chairs and tables of black-looking wood with thin crooked legs and puppy feet. The mantelpieces are wide and high, and have not only timepieces and cabbages sculpted over the front, but a real timepiece, which makes a prodigious ticking on the top in the middle, with a flower pot containing a cabbage standing on each extremity by way of outrider. Between each cabbage and the timepiece again is a little china man having a large stomach with a great round hole in it, through which is seen the dial plate of a watch. <clears throat> the fireplaces are large and deep with fierce, crooked-looking fire dogs. There is constantly a rousing fire and a huge pot over it, full of sauerkraut and pork, to which the good woman of the house is always busy in attending. She is a little fat old lady with blue eyes and a red face and wears a huge cap of a sugar loaf ornamented with purple and yellow ribbons. Her dress is of orange-colored linsey woolsey, uh, made very full behind and very short in the waist, and indeed very short in other respects, not reaching below the middle of her leg. 
which is somewhat thick, and so are her ankles, but she has a fine pair of green stockings to cover them. Her shoes of pink leather are fastened each with a bunch of yellow ribbons puckered up in the shape of a cabbage. In her left hand, she has a little heavy Dutch watch. In her right, she wields a ladle for the sauerkraut and pork. By her side, there stands a fat tabby cat with a gilt toy repeater tied to its tail, which the boys have there fastened by way of a quiz. The boys themselves are all three of them in the garden attending the pig. They are each two feet in height. They have three cornered cocked hats, purple waistcoats reaching down to their thighs, buckskin knee breeches, red woolen stockings, heavy shoes with big silver buckles, and long cert, uh, <coughs> long surtouts, long surtouts, long surtout coats with large buttons of mother of pearl. Each two has a pipe in his mouth and a little dumpy watch in his right hand. He takes a puff and a look, and then a look and a puff. The pig, which is corpulent and lazy, is occupied now in picking up the stray leaves that fall from the cabbages, and now in giving a kick behind at the gilt repeater, which the urchins have also tied to his tail, in order to make him look as handsome as the cat. Right at the front door, in a high-backed, leather-bottomed armchair with crooked legs and puppy feet like, uh, puppy feet like the tables, is seated the old man of the house himself. He is an exceedingly puffy little old gentleman, with big circular eyes and a huge double chin. His dress resembles that of the boys, and I need say nothing further about it. All the difference is that his pipe is somewhat bigger than theirs, and he can make a greater smoke. Like them, he has a watch, but he carries his watch in his pocket. To say the truth, he has something of more importance than a watch to attend to, and with that is I shall presently and what that is I shall presently explain. He sits with his right leg upon his left knee, wears a grave countenance, and always keeps one of his eyes at least resolutely bent upon a certain remarkable object in the center of the plain. This object is situated at the steeple of the house of the town council. The town council are all very little, round, oily, intelligent men, with big saucer eyes and fat double chins, and have their coats much longer and their shoe buckles much bigger than the ordinary inhabitants of Vondervidermittis. Since my sojourn in the borough, they have had several special meetings and have adopted these three important resolutions. That it is wrong to alter the good old course of things, that there is nothing tolerable out of Vondervidermittis, and that we will stick by our clocks and our cabbages. The above session room of the council is, in, is the steeple, and in the steeple is the belfry, where exists and has existed time out of mind the pride and wonder of the village, the great clock of the borough of Vondervidermittis. And this is the object to which the eyes of the old gentlemen are turned who sit in the leather-bottomed armchairs. The great clock has seven faces, and one, one in each of the seven sides of the steeple, so that it can be readily seen from all quarters. Its faces are large and white, and its hands heavy and black. There is a belfry man whose sole duty is to attend to it, but this duty is the most perfect of sinecures. Uh, for the clock of Vondervitimitis was never yet known to have anything the matter with it. Until lately, the bare supposition of such a thing was considered heretical. From the remotest period of antiquity to which the archives have reference, the hours have been regularly struck by the big bell. And indeed, the case was just the same with all the other clocks and watches in the borough. Never was such a place for keeping the true time. When the large clapper thought proper to say twelve o'clock, all its obedient followers opened their throats simultaneously and responded like a very echo. In short, the good burghers were fond of their sauerkraut, but then they were proud of their clocks. All people who hold sin, uh, sinecure offices, sin, all people who hold sinecure offices are held in more or less respect. And as the belfry man of Vondervidimitis has the most perfect of sinecures, uh, he is the most perfectly respected of any man in the world. He is the chief dignitary of the borough, and the very pigs look up to him with a sentiment of reverence. His coat tail is very far is very far longer, his pipe, his shoe buckles, his eyes, and his stomach very far bigger than those of any other old gentleman in the village. And as to his chin, it is not only double but triple. I have thus painted the happy estate of Vondervitimitis, alas, that so fair a picture should ever experience a reverse. 
There has been long a saying amongst the wisest inhabitants that no good can come from over the hills, and it really seemed that the words had in them something of the spirit of prophecy. It wanted five minutes of noon on the day before yesterday, when there appeared a very odd-looking object on the summit of the ridge to the eastward. Such an occurrence, of course, attracted universal attention and every little old gentleman who sat in a leather-bottomed armchair turned one of his eyes to a stare of dismay upon the phenomenon, still keeping the other upon the clock in the steeple. By the time that it wanted only three minutes to noon, the droll object in question was perceived to be a very diminutive foreign-looking young man. He descended the hills at a great rate so that everybody had soon a good look at him. He was really the most finicky little personage that had ever been seen in von der Vitamidis. His countenance was of a dark snuff color, and he had a long hooked nose, pea-eyed, pea-eyes, a wide mouth, and an excellent set of teeth which later he seemed anxious of displaying, as he was grinning from ear to ear. What with mustachios and whiskers, there was none of the rest of his face to be seen. His head was uncovered, and his hair neatly done up in uh, papillotes. His dress was a tight-fitting swallowtail black coat from one of whose pockets dangled a vast length of white handkerchief. Black kerseymere knee breeches, black stockings, and stumpy-looking pumps with huge bunches of black satin ribbon for bows. Under one arm he carried a huge chapeau de bras, and under the other a fiddle nearly five times as big as himself. In his left hand was a gold snuff box, from which, as he capered down the hill, cutting all manner of fantastical steps, he took snuff incessantly, with an air of the greatest possible self-satisfaction. God bless me, he here was a sight for the honest burghers of von der Vitamitis. To speak plainly, this fellow had, in spite of his grinning, an audacious and sinister kind of face, and as he curveted right into the village, the odd stumpy appearance of his pumps ex excited no little suspicion, and many a burgher who beheld him that day would have given a trifle for a peep beneath the white cambric handkerchief which hung so obtrusively from his pocket, from the pocket of his swallow-tailed coat. But what mainly occasioned a righteous indignation was that the scoundrelly popinjay, while he cut a fandango here and a whirligig there, did not seem to have the remotest idea in the world of such a thing as keeping time in his steps. The good people of the borough had scarcely a chance, however, to get their eyes thoroughly open, when, just as it wanted half a minute of noon, the rascal bounced, as I say, right into the midst of them, gave a chasse here and a balancé there, and then, after a pirouette and a pas de zephyr, pigeon-winged himself right up into the belfry of the house of the town council, where the wonder-stricken belfry man sat smoking at a, in a state of dignity and dismay. But the little chap seized him at once by the nose, gave it a swing and a pur pull, clapped the big cha chapeau de bras upon his head, knocked it down over his eyes and mouth, and then, lifting up the big fiddle, beat him with it so long and so soundly that... What with the belfry man being so fat, the fiddle and the fiddle being so hollow, you would have sworn that there was a regiment of double bass drummers all beating the devil's tattoo upon or up in the belfry of the steeple in von der Vitamitis. There is no knowing to what desperate act of vengeance this unprincipled attack might have aroused the inhabitants, but for the important fact that it now wanted only half a second of noon. The bell was about to strike, and it was a matter of absolute and preeminent necessity that everybody should look well at his watch. It was evident, however, that just at this moment the fellow in the steeple was doing something that he had no business to do with the clock. But as it now began to strike, nobody had any time to attend to his maneuvers, for they had all to count the strokes of the bell as it sounded. One, said the clock. Von echoed every little old gentleman in every leather-bottomed armchair in von der Vitamitis. Von, said his watch also. Von, said the watch of his vrouw. And von, said the watch watches of the boys and the little gilt repeaters on the tails of the cat and pig. Two, continued the big bell, and do, repeated all the repeaters. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, Ten, said the bell. Dree, vor, five, zax, sieben, eight, 
Nine, ten, answered the others. Eleven, said the big one. Eleven, assented the little ones. Twelve, said the bell. Dwelf, they replied, perfectly satisfied and dropping their voices. Und dwelf it is, said all the little old gentlemen, putting up their watches. But the big bell had not done with them yet. Thirteen, he said. Der Teufel, gasped the little old gentleman, turning pale, dropping their pipes and putting down all their right legs from over their left knees. Der Teufel, groaned they. Der Teen, der Teen. Mein Gott, it is der Teen o'clock. Why attempt to describe the terrible scene which ensued? All von der Vitimitis flew at once into lamentable, a l- lamentable state of uproar. What is come to mein Pelly? roared all the boys. I've been angry for this hour. What is come to mein Kraut? screamed all the vrows. It is. It has been done to rags for this hour. What is come to mein pipe? swore all the little old gentlemen. Donder and Blitzen, it has been smoked out for this hour. And they filled them up again in a great rage and sinking back in their armchairs puffed away so fast and so fiercely that the whole valley was immediately filled with impenetrable smoke. Meantime, the cabbages all turned very red in the face, and it seemed as if old Nick himself had taken possession of everything in the shape of a timepiece. The clocks carved upon the furniture took to dancing as if bewitched, while upon while those upon the mantelpieces could scarcely contain themselves for fury, and kept such a continual striking of thirteen, and such a frisking and wriggling of their pendulums as was really horrible to see, but worse than all, neither the cats nor the pigs could put up any longer with the behavior of the little repeaters tied to their tails and resented it by scampering all over the place, scratching and poking and squeaking and screeching and caterwauling and squalling and flying into the faces and running under the petticoats of the people and creating altogether the most abominable din and confusion which it is possible for a reasonable person to conceive. And to make matters still more distressing, the rascally little scapegrace in the steeple was evidently exerting himself to the utmost. Every now and then, one might catch a glimpse of the scoundrel through the smoke. There he sat in the belfry upon the belfry man, who was lying flat upon his back. In his teeth, the villain held the bell rope, which he kept jerking about with his head, raising such a clatter that my ears ring again even to think of it. On his lap lay the big fiddle at which he was scraping. Out of all time and tune, with both hands making a great show, the nincompoop of playing Judy O'Flanahan and Patty O'Rafferty. Affairs being thus miserably situated, I left the place in disgust, and now appeal for aid to all lovers of correct time and fine kraut. Let us proceed in a body to the burrow, and restore the ancient order of things in Vondervitimitis by ejecting that little fellow from the steeple. <clears throat> I did not know, upon selecting that, based on the title, that I would have to say von der Vit- Vitimitis many, many times. I did not know that I was going to have words written in pronunciation to try and evoke a German pronunciation. Honestly, I think that was more of a terror to read out loud in a sight reading than it was a horror story. Unless you think my reading was a horror story, which I might agree with you with on. Uh, <clears throat> the Telltale Heart is a good one, but probably... Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> von der Vatiem... Von der... Vatiamitis? Wonder what... Oh my gosh! You are right, Key Squared! Wonder Vatiamitis. Wonder what time it is. Yeah, it's wonder what time it is. And I didn't get that because I was just trying to read it, but now that I've read the story, it is obvious that it is wonder what time it is. Wonder Vatiamitis. Vandervatiamitis. Which he did in other places. Like, um, there were other places where Blunderbuzzard, uh, 
stuff and puff, the words that aren't actually like German words, they're just made to look like German words or Germanic words. Um, but yeah, wonder what time it is, is wonder what time it is. Um, I just took it as a place name. Whatever. It was fun to read. <laughs> and it definitely took us past the end of, or the normal end time for the stream. So uh, I want to, I'll switch back over to face for a minute. And uh, I definitely want to say thank you to everybody for joining me uh, for Archival Adventures today. Hopefully you had fun. Hopefully you learned something or, or just enjoyed the um, variety of items that I brought. Uh, we looked at some true crime f local to um, the Blacksburg area where Virginia Tech is located. We looked at um, some collections containing human hair because human hair. Uh, we looked at illustration by Edward Gorey and we read a poem or a story by Edgar Allan Poe. Um, next week on Wednesday at 2.30 p.m. Eastern time, I will be live again on both twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios and twitch.tv slash Rogan27 for another Archival Adventures where we will continue with the items on this cart. So uh, continuing with the spoopy vibes, uh, there will be definitely at least one more story from Edgar Allan Poe and possibly some uh, um, stories from some of these pulp uh, sci-fi books, pulp horror books, um, if I get a chance to look at some of the copyright on them to see if there's something I want to read. Um, <laughs> you didn't know Poe did puns. Um, yes, it was very much a cross between hobbits and fairy tale gnomes in that description. Um, I'm glad that you all enjoy coming. I'm glad that I, I really enjoy doing this and I'm glad that um, when people show up, they have a good time. Uh, sometimes my reaction is even better than, than the items. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. Um, I'm just gonna check right now and see where we're gonna go. Um, just to see if there's anybody else that we want to say hello to. We could, yeah, let's do. I usually go to Monterey Bay Aquarium, but today we have the opportunity to raid another library. They are not doing um, old, <laughs> they're not doing archives, but uh, North Carolina State University Libraries is currently live and they are doing 3D printing with makerspaces. Uh, so they're working on some 3D modeling. So um, join me for the raid, say hello to them, uh, let them know um, that they, have an audience uh, and maybe learn something about 3D modeling for 3D printing. Um, that is quite an interesting subject. And yeah, thank you all for coming and I hope that I see you next week.